I know his mom, Becky Brown, here, and his dad, and his sister. <laughs> but I haven't been keeping in touch with Adam for quite a while. So I'm not sure exactly all to say, except that he, uh, the other day he offered to come in and share his craft with us and um, the history behind it. And I'm just so glad that you could join us. So whatever you Thank want you. more you want to say about yourself, please. Help me out. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no worries. Well, I'm an ethnobotanist, which is the study of the interaction between people and plants. It mixes science and chemistry and botany and anthropology, archaeology, all of those sorts of things together. And um, hence the interest in ancestral skills and related things. Um, also, um, I've always been a hobbyist. I love to make things with my hands, you know, and just so and all of the things that pile into it. And, um, when he was three, he got a spool of thread and a safety pin and tied his very first fly. It looked like an ant and caught a fish with it. Wow. Not three. You I did about, have a real you hook. You were about eight. <laughs> wow. I did have a real hook. Oh, I thought you had a safety No, no, it was a real hook. It was a real hook. sewing thread and <laughs> an ant, and he actually caught a fish. He was about eight years old. Creative, very creative. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just autistic enough to like pick something difficult and then like hyper fixate on it until I get it, you know, <laughs> which which helps with difficult skills like this, you know. So. beautiful flies now. Yes, you um, <laughs> so yeah, we have a uh, little YouTube channel. Um, very very little so far. Very very little. Um, homesteading broadly defined uh yes a lot of the botany and the gardening and, and that sort of stuff in there but also all this all the ancillary skills that go with it mm -hmm. right you know the the knots to bundle a bag and how to build a chicken coop and laying dry laid stone and carving in the winter like the like the sloyd tradition of carving your way through a long dark winter all of the you know the ancillaries that go with it so that's the that's the channel, and I'm, I'm grateful that you're willing to let me film this in your presence. Hopefully, the it actually records. Because <laughs> if you're tying a knot, it's easy. Like, oh, I'll tie that one again if it doesn't record properly. If you're doing an hour-long presentation, it does. It's like, eh, it's anyway. <laughs> but so we'll see. So assuming all goes well, then if you want to go and subscribe to the channel, you can go watch this presentation again if you're interested in doing so. Um, but that's enough about me. You wanted to talk about rocks. Mm -hmm. Rocks are great. I have pet rocks here, so we'll, we'll talk about all of <laughs> that. Um, flint napping comes from British terms. Flint being the stone being worked, and napping just means to shape. Mm -hmm. Okay? To nap is to shape something. Okay? It's just an old British word. A uh, couple of things we need to talk about here getting into this. How we do it explains what rocks you need. Then we'll talk about the rocks that we are using, and then we will shape some stones. And I'll show you the techniques and demonstrate the different stages along the way and some of the history as we go. So the basic idea is that if you have a mineral or a rock that is sufficiently smooth and has no cleavage planes, then when you strike it, the shock wave that you initiate when you strike the rock will propagate according to predictable physics. And the physics is the same as a wave on a pond or in your bathtub. Right? If you fill your bathtub and you throw a rubber ducky in, right, you get ripples. That's a standard standing wave. Okay? Just uh, you know, the water molecule starts at one position. It shifts up when the rave crest comes to the highest position, called the anti-node. It recedes back to neutral, called the node, and then goes to the negative anti-node back up to neutral. Right? So standard wave. Okay? You can also have a wave in pressure. Right? You're hearing the volume of my voice. This is a pressure wave. Right? The peak is now defined as air molecules being close together and the trough far apart. Right, so you're making the air, air molecules vibrate in, in pressure, right? But it's still a type of, you know, standing. Wave. So, if we have a mineral with distinct cleavage planes, 
no matter how you strike it, it will always follow those cleavage planes. And all of the fractures will have a standard angle. Okay? A good example of this is table salt. Take, table, take a pinch of table salt, look at it under a magnifying glass. They're all cubes. If you hit a cube of salt, you get a smaller cube of salt, but it's never not a cube or a rectangle because there's a 90 degree plane of cleavage. Okay, So all you can do is change the size of the rectangles, but you can never make it not a rectangle. You can't nap that. Okay, If you take a granite with really distinct big crystals in it, you can't nap it either because if you shock the rock, the, the wave is just going to go around the crystals. And you can't control that. It's already predetermined by where the crystals are in the rock. So you get differently sized and shaped irregular bits, but you can't build an edge on it. Okay. If you get something with a felted texture like a jade, you just can't basically break it at all. But there's this sweet spot where something is hard enough to take an edge brittle enough to be easily chipped and um, smooth enough that the wave propagates freely and now you have a nappable rock. Okay? So if you take whatever hammer you're using, right, whether it's a copper or an antler, and you strike the rock, from the angle of incident that shock wave is coming at 110 degrees down. And that's predictable. When the grains get too big, you lose that predictability. Okay? And so this is what defines the stones that are nappable. I said granite is not a nappable stone, but this piece of obsidian is chemically identical to the granite, but since it hardened quickly by coming to the surface and hardening rapidly in the air or sometimes in water, although the stuff that goes into water tends to be too highly fractured to be really awesome. But since it's hardened very rapidly, it forms a natural glass. So it's chemically identical to granite, but granite is not nappable, obsidian is. Okay. Intermediate is rhyolite. It forms a little bit, it, it hardens a little bit slower it has a coarser grain, but it's still a fine enough grain that it can um, be chipped and throw that fracture predictably. Now, which of these do you think is going to make the sharper edge? The obsidian. The obsidian! Yeah, no question about it. Because the increase in grain size does mean that you will have a duller edge, but also means you will have a tougher tool. If you're making an arrow to shoot a deer out of obsidian, you're not getting more than one shot. Right? You hit cartilage, you'll shatter it into a bajillion pieces. You hit leather, you'll shatter it into a bajillion pieces. So it's a one-use tool. Whereas this, you can make a plow out of. Okay? So it won't be as sharp, but it will be tougher. As the grain size grows and you get more of a felted configuration, you get tougher and tougher and tougher until you hit jade, which is the toughest natural known material. Okay? And actually the most similar to steel in terms of stone tool making. Hmm. But you can't chip it. If you look at pre-metallurgical -metal cultures that have really highly refined wood carving and bone carving traditions, they usually have jade resources. Because you can make the, a jade edge only has to be about 10 or 15 degrees thicker than a steel edge. So you can still make a very sharp tool out of it. But it has that toughness. Much tougher than diamonds. Diamonds shatter. Hmm. Okay, diamonds shatter very easily. They're hard, but they're brittle. Hmm. Extremely brittle. Okay. Diamond cutters, they don't cut diamonds. They put them in a vise and they tap them gently and they shatter. But they have a cleavage plane, so it's predictable. Hmm. And they're going for chunks. They're not trying to make a diamond knife, right? Um, so yeah. Jade is the toughest natural material. Diamond is the hardest natural material. But because jade has a felted texture, it's chemically identical to asbestos, but it has a felted texture. The difference is the crystal structure. Jade's harmless. Asbestos is... Jade is tough, hard, and harmless. Asbestos is soft, stringy, and lethal. The difference is how it crystallized. 
So it's not just what the material is made of, it's how it forms. Okay? So this is the igneous category. I'll pass these around. This is the igneous category. And the, the rhyolite here, that's Adam, Adams County rhyolite. That is what the majority of the artifacts from this area are made of. So that's a raw chunk. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So the, the rhyolite one step coarser is um, still potentially workable. Like your, some of your fine grain basalts are workable. But usually they show up more in like the axe and garden tool category of implements. Not the, you know, knife, kitchen knife type of implement. Okay? Um, coarser than that, you just lose the ability to nap it. Okay? So that's kind of the igneous series. But we, we also have sedimentary materials. Okay? And this is your flints and chirts. Now, chert forms by the same process at, that allows a dinosaur bone to fossilize. You have an initial deposit, usually limestone, but they can form in other materials. But it has to be, the initial deposit has to be a material, beloved, can you grab this one? They're not sure what to do with them. <laughs> so, thanks, Adam. The, um, most common initial material is limestone or something limey. It needs to be a material that water can erode away easily. Okay? There are cherts that have for, that form in coal beds, like Knife River chert from the Dakotas is silica replaced coal. You can have uh, you know silicified siltstones that can build up. But either you have in in those anomalies a very porous material, but usually Limestone, which is a very erodible material. Water comes in, it erodes away the original material and replaces it with silica. Okay. And once you get above about 80% silica, we'll wait for the vehicle. Okay. Once you get about 80% silica or higher, Assuming it's in what's called the cryptocrystalline form, which just means microscopic crystals, you develop a chert that is nappable. Okay? The higher the silica content and the smaller the crystals of silica that form in it, the more glassy and brittle it is and the sharper it will get. But again, we have this same trade-off. As you get the ability to have a keener edge, it becomes a one-use tool. Okay. So there's always this hardness to toughness trade-off. The harder things get, the tougher they get. This is true of metals as well, right? Take a file, whack it once with a hammer, what happens? It shatters. It shatters, it's too hard. Take a butter knife, whack it with a hammer, it just goes, you know, <laughs> right? But the file takes a, a abrasion resistant edge, the butter knife will barely take an edge, right? So there's always a trade-off between hardness and brittleness and your toughness. That's why really good edge materials are rare. You know, the for, for that reason, right? Um, so I can show you a few items here. This is Texas chert, and you can still see the rind of the limestone that, formed, that it formed in. Okay. So I'll pass him around. And then this is a cobble of something in the process of being replaced with harder material. Okay. This came, this is a, a glacial pebble. I don't know where it came from or what formation it is. But um, you can see it's got ironstone forming on the outside and it's starting to coalesce on the inside if you look at the grain structure. But this is still too large a grain structure to be nappable. So that's not workable. And then this is from the same glacial deposit. This is Onondaga Chert from Upper New York, although I found this in Steuben County. So just, uh, just north of the Pennsylvania border, okay? 
That's a big clobber knocker of Onondaga Chert. Okay? So, you have to form the chert, and then you have to keep it intact. So, right through the middle of Pennsylvania, there is a big seam, a thick seam of chert called the Kaiser Chert. Runs right along 522, and there's big outcrops along Penn's Creek and in uh, like the Shemokin area, and that goes right across the middle of the state, this huge band of chert. And it's all almost useless. Okay? Because this is a sample of one of these, I'm not sure, I've, I've had a, a couple different samples of, of similar things that do similar things. But if you look, these are, this just broke into cubes, and a lot of the Onondaga chert does the same thing. And all of these cubes, you can see this old surface. Yeah. Okay. So the Onondaga chert and the Kaiser chert, the two big bands here in the Mid-Atlantic, are ancient. They are Devonian. They are further behind the origin of dinosaurs that, than the extinction of dinosaurs is behind us. Wow. So you go from modern time to the comet. You go back that far again. You go back that far again, and you just go a little further. And you have the formation of these chirps. So the Appalachian Mountains have been uplifted and eroded down to nothing three times. And these chirps formed before any of that happened. So they were driven, as mountains grow, the earth compresses and goes in both directions. So these chirps formed on the bottom layer that got pushed down. And as the mountains eroded, they came back up. They got pushed down again, and then they came back up, and they got pushed down. So it's been up and down, up and down, up and down. They're just shattered. Oh. So you start working them, and you have these pre-existent cracks that formed hundreds of millions of years ago. And you start working them, and you start getting making some progress, and then they turn into ice cubes, right? <laughs> So this is ice cubes of, I, I'm not sure if this is from Onondaga or Kaiser Band, but you can see the chert ice cubes. So it's chert no matter what mm -hmm. the parent material was. Correct. Right? Now, cherts get named different things, right? So the Kaiser chert is a locality. The um, Onondaga chert is a locality. Um, some colorful ones get gemstone names. Like there's a beautiful red chert from Australia called Mookite, but it's still a chert. Black chert people call flint. Okay? Or there's three definitions for flint that I've heard over the years. One is black chert. One is chert that formed with chalk as the predecessor, thus making English and Danish flint the only true flints. And then there's chert which formed in anything lime based which makes almost all chert flint right and they're completely incongruous ultimately geologists name things by formation and don't worry about those mineral names right those are more for collectors and people with too much time on their hands um but all chert you know all of these silica replaced sedimentary materials are cherts some of those chirts get rather arbitrarily renamed flints. Okay? So chert is the most generic name. Flint starts arguments. I'm not going to get into any of the arguments. It's dumb. It's all the same stuff. It's silica that replaced in pre-existing sedimentary material. Okay? Questions so far? Okay. Let's pick a rock to bust. There's just one on top. So we need to look at our stone, and we need to think about the tools. That's the next thing. I've already said that from the angle of impact, the angle of fracture is 110 degrees. Okay? So what a lot of people that are new to this hobby want to do is they want to say, I want to split this in half. I'll turn it and hit it that way. But if you turn this up on edge and hit it in the middle, what you're really trying to do is bust off the corners. Because remember, 110 degrees. Mm -hmm. So if I hit it here, I'm trying to break that off, not break it in half. 
So what you actually need to do is you need to find a location that's backsloped and then hit straight down towards the edge of the slope. Okay? The place that you strike needs to be below the center of mass in the direction that you're striking. Okay? So if my hand is the rock, I can hit here because the center of mass would be here, right? So I could come and hit down on that edge. But if I hit above the center of mass, I'm more likely to either do nothing or fracture the rock. I won't get a good flake come off, okay? So you have to hit below the center of mass in the direction you're striking. If this was upside down, I have no avenue of attack because the edge is above the center of mass. So I would have to reshape. If I wanted to take a flake off this face, I would have to reshape the edge such that I have some sort of downslope below the center of mass on which to strike. That's what nappers call preparing a platform. Okay? So these techniques are very, very ancient. How old do you think that this is, this is fairly complicated, right? This is not a primitive skill, right? I hope, I hope I've shared that much with you already. Very complicated. How long have people been doing this? Mm. What would you guess? I'm trying to remember how old the Clovis people, didn't the Clovis people? Clovis is, oh, way before Clovis. Clovis, Clovis, Clovis is like 10, 12,000 years ago. There's, there's cave paintings from France that date back, you know, over 100,000 years. So that's still yesterday in the history of this craft. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. I, I know that there's pictures of that. But. Three to three and a half million years. It not only predates Homo sapien, it predates the genus Homo. Austriopithecus was flint napping. And in modern time, there are chimpanzees that do it. <laughs> so this is deeply, <laughs> deeply ancient. Now, they're not doing what I'm about to do. They, they, there's a couple of uh, clans of chimp in Africa that figured out they can take a, a hard rock, give it a big old throw, and occasionally get a useful tool. Right? But the oldest, you know, associations of sharp tools with other hominid finds look much like that. So for a, a long time in that three, three and a half million years, it was a very simple thing. And then grew in complexity, okay? Mm -hmm. Grew in complexity over time. And reaches its most complex in cultures that also had copper. Okay. So the most complex flint artifacts most people agree are the Danish daggers from Europe. They were made at a time where Denmark was still in the Stone Age, but Bell Beaker was introducing bronze technology to their neighbors. They had copper. Right? The Native Americans have artifacts that are almost as complex. They were just stylistically different. The, the, the Danish daggers are modeling, they're making the bronze forms in stone, which is why they were so much more complex. The Native American cultures, when they hit their most complex, like an Enoch uh, points, um, you know, some of the really thin bifaces, some of the um, Mesoamerican eccentric forms, take every bit as much knowledge and work and time as the Danish daggers. There's not mm. quite as recognized. All of those cultures also have copper. Native Americans are working metal long before Europeans knew what it was. Mm. Okay? So, your copper technology in Europe goes back about 6,000 years. It goes back 10,000 years in North America. Okay? So copper is an allowable tool and can still be authentic. 
However, what's authentic is another whole conversation because there is an unbroken chain of knowledge linking this distant past of flint napping to modern practitioners. Okay? There's a myth that was told that this was totally forgotten and then one guy, Ishii, remembered it, reintroduced it to the rest of the world. No, 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 no. Um, if, has anybody heard of the Ishii story? No, he was a, a Native American person who had um, survived acculturation in California until the late, very late 1800s. Okay. But 50 years earlier, there are academic papers describing all of the skills that he would then demonstrate. Just one generation of white academics forgot how to flint nap and then assumed the whole world had. <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's an unbroken chain of knowledge, not just in North America, but everywhere, you know, leading this into modern time, including like the, the muzzle loader flint nappers in England and, um, you know, cultures around the world. So this is not something that like died and has been reintroduced. This is a continuum. Right, so to say that an artifact that I make today is a reproduction is as dumb as saying a painting that an artist painted today is a reproduction, right? It's just not old. Anything touched by human hands is an artifact. It's just not an old artifact. It's an authentically Adam today artifact, <laughs> right? And copper has been with flint napping for 10,000 years in North America and about 4,000 years in Europe. So copper is a legitimate tool to consider. That brings us to the toolkit. Okay. So as we start working this rock, we're going to use a series of tools going through. When I'm first starting, I'm looking at it, I'm trying to find where I have opportunities to remove a flake. Okay, so right along here, you see how this is, is sloped? Okay, so along this edge, I have kind of opportunities. Here at this corner, I have a good opportunity. Here there's a protrusion which blocks me from getting to the slope. So I have no opportunity here yet. And then here at the corner, again, I have a protrusion here which keeps me from getting to that edge. So here's a good opportunity. Here's a good opportunity, because this edge is sloped and the point is below the center of mass in that direction. Okay. But I would want to use very different tools on these two areas. Here, where I would be working well up from the edge, like right about where my finger is, I need a strong, hard, sharp force to initiate the crack. So you use a hard hammer. Hard hammer is another rock. <laughs> okay? But the easiest way to use hammer stones when you're doing hammer stone percussion is to work well up from the edge. Now, so I'm not going to strike there. I'm going to strike up here. Coming down on it, and then the flake's going to go sideways. That's the thing to remember. When you strike down, the flake goes sideways because of that... Um, wave propagation behavior, okay? And there's the first flake removal. Huh. Okay? Now if I put this back on, you can see there's some shattering underneath here because that was a very hard blow. But you can see I struck down on that edge and now I'll pass this around. You can see what I took off. That's hard hammer. Everyone, please be careful. That is sharp. It is very sharp. It is very sharp. We're all adults here, so I'm not too worried. Um, now, if I want to work on an edge, I'm just trying to find a piece that has a good edge opportunity. Um, the other extreme know, is a soft hammer, antler, or even some hard woods. Right, um, hornbeam is really hard, uh, dogwood is really hard, live oak, some of these really hard woods 
can be used for flint napping hammers. Okay? So when you're using this, you have a slightly different behavior. Because this material is soft, it is compressible. So when I use a soft hammer, I'm not working up here on the edge. I'm going to work right on the edge. And because it's sharp, it will dig into the soft hammer, compress the material, then the material will expand, much like the physics of a bow and arrow. You know, like you're compressing the wood in the belly of the bow, and then you release it. The expansive force of the belly of the bow propels the string and the arrow it's carrying. Okay? But because it will dig in to the edge of the hammer, you can work right on that sharp edge and grab and pull off a piece. Oh. Okay? Mm -hmm. Whereas the hard hammer would just crush. So I don't have a great... This rock needs a little bit of work, but I'm just trying to get a preliminary demonstration of this. So here, I just brush away some of that chattered stuff. This is probably going to hinge on me. There's problems in it, and I do need a heavier hammer. This is a moose antler billet. Um, but here, I can work right on the edge with the soft hammer. Okay, good. It's not a really big flake, but I wasn't... I'm just happy it didn't hinge off in here. <laughs> okay, so that is when you're working on the edges, you want to use the softer material. It's a little grabbier, and you can like grab and pull off nice long flakes. Okay? Halfway in between is a copper. You can work on the edge, directly on the edge with the copper, because it will, I mean, you can see how, I'll just pass this tool around, you can see how beat up this is and all the little divots in it. It will make a divot and pull, just like the antler will, but it won't compress, just like the antler will. So it's intermediate. You can work with copper a little bit up from the edge or right on the edge, but the edge has to be a stouter edge than what you use with an antler, okay? So antler, you want a fairly sharp edge copper you want a fairly blunt edge stone you want to work above the edge now are there ways yes I can hand that back around are there ways to cheat and use any of these tools in any of these ways yes but this is kind of the the easiest way to conceptualize them at first then you can learn all the cheats later <laughs> right uh, most modern nappers are using copper because it's readily available like, it's hard to find a moose in Pennsylvania. <laughs> they used to be here. Black Machannon is an old English name for moose, and this is what the state park is named out of. So there used to be the moose all the way down through here. Right? And the fossil record of caribou goes all the way to Alabama. So, you know, those critters used to be around, but they're not anymore. Okay? So, you know, but that's the difference. You can see how this the stone was working well above the edge. Now, you can still get this flake with copper. You need a bigger hammer and um, a hard copper rather than a soft one. But you can still do this with copper, and you can work on the edge with stone, but it's hard. Okay? So that's the idea. And then we will peel flake after flake, and you're, you're, you're taking the stone and mushing it in from the edges. That's the concept. Okay? Now, this is the most common stone tool. And this is where it gets hard to distinguish between artifact and geofact. Right? Artifact from the word artifice, meaning the touch of human hands. Okay? But could this, could just this happen from this rock tumbling off waterfall? Yeah. Right? So most stone tools are missed by archaeologists. It was very, very common, especially in areas that are flint poor, like here. There is no flint in Sullivan County. At all. I have seen some little glacial cobbles, but nothing large enough to even attempt to work. Okay? That big chunk of Onondaga that I was passing around, that comes out of the Valley Heads Moraine. 
which is what dams the Finger Lakes. South of that moraine, there's no flint. There's nothing until you get to Adams County, okay, where you have that rhyolite. Mm -hmm. So right here in this area, about two-thirds of the artifacts are made of that rhyolite. It's closer by land to get the Onondaga Chert from its deposit, which is at the north edge of the Finger Lakes. But there's no water route. So it was easier mm -hmm. to form a trade route, you know, to do trade by canoe from here mm -hmm. all the way down to Gettysburg. And this does underlie, that formation underlies pretty much all of Gettysburg. Right, that rhyolite is what the, you know, all of those, those hills are made of. Okay, there's only a few places where it's good enough to nap. That was gifted to me. I don't know exactly where it came from. I just know that it's that area. Um, but the, uh, the ease of taking a canoe all the way down there exceeded the ease of schlepping by land from north of the Finger Lakes. So here, about two-thirds of the artifacts are that. The East Coast is very poor in nappable materials. The Midwest, there's really rich pockets. And then the far west, it's everywhere. Right? So around here, in areas that are flint poor, it would not be uncommon to have a stone this size that you keep with you all the time, and when you need a tool, you bust one off, you use it, and then you throw it away. A multi-purpose. <laughs> yeah, so this is a core. This yeah. is used as a core. Just about all of the flint napping in the old world, with a few notable exceptions, like I've already mentioned, are core-based technology, right? The preferential lavawa of the Neanderthal and the microblades of the Mesopotamians and, you know, all of these core-based technologies where you're carrying a core like this or one that's deliberately shaped to be easy to knock off long blades and you would carry the core with you, bust off a tool when you need one, butcher your deer and throw it away. Okay. So this is your most common tool. Now this you wouldn't throw away. This has an arrowhead in it yet. Right. Um, wouldn't be much bigger than your thumb till I knock all the useless stuff off of that. But you'll get an arrowhead about big, about the size of your thumb, and that is a true arrowhead. Anything bigger than the tip of your thumb ain't an arrowhead. Mm. It's twice that size. It's an atlatl dart or a thrusting spear. If it's more than twice that size, it's a kitchen knife. Because of the brittleness. You know, anything bigger than about twice the size of the tip of your thumb is too brittle mm. to use as a weapon. Okay? It's just not durable enough. Mm -hmm. That is your cared for kitchen knife. Mm. And then as you sharpen it down, it, it reduces its size. Now it's a spear. And you break it off and reform it. Now it's an arrowhead. Yeah. So every tool would go through multiple lives. Unless it's just started out small, right? Um, this is a pretty tough chert, so that would make a, a pretty durable arrowhead. So we will keep him. But you would take something like this and nap it into something like this, and then this is what you would haul. And this is the material of trade. It's called trade platforms. And we see these cached all over the place, especially in Flint poor areas. So if all y'all are a tribe, right, maybe me and maybe you, maybe you, we'll go get in a canoe, and we'll be away for two or three months down in Adams County take some materials to give to the people who are there, ask permission, harvest some rock, and while we're sitting there in the quarry, bust these into these. And on the way back up river, everywhere that we're going to spend considerable amounts of time, we'll put a few dozen of them in a spot where we'll know where to find them later. Hmm. And then we'll only do that every few years. That's how Flint gets into this area. question everyone else asks is, how do I go find Flint? Well, first you have to go where it is, and it ain't here, <laughs> okay? It is not here. Um, the, the best piece I've ever found is the one I showed you, and that was out of a stone and gravel quarry in the bath area.
Is that like Fascinating. serendipity? Oh. Yes, it is serendipity. Yes. Uh -huh. So in in the East, you can occasionally go flint noticing, but you're never going to successfully go flint hunting. <laughs> okay. Unless you're right on one of those key deposits, mm. right? You have the Pennsylvania Jasper, you have the Kishkamaquilis Valley Chert, you have the Adams County Rhyolite, and you have the uh, Onondaga Chert. Those are the only deposits worth hunting. All of the others that break into ice cubes are used locally a little because if it's right there, it's worth spending a whole day busting through a bunch of junk to find one usable piece mm. rather than go all the way down to Gettysburg. But you're not going to come up here to go get a yeah. cartload of garbage, right? So um, that's huh. the idea. So let's bust some rocks. Um, when you're working one of these, where'd my, there it is. It's just a sequential process of working the edges thinner and thinner. The first stage is getting rid of all of the goobers and potential cracks. This this piece looks fairly crack free, okay. But when you're working a piece that looks like this, there's a lot that could be hiding, mm -hmm. right? And you don't know until you start breaking it and opening piece, you know, and opening it up. You don't know what you're going to find on in here, okay. The wider it is, the better, right? This is a very bad shape to work. This is this is a problem child, okay? Um, native people with a lot of options would never pick this one up, right? This is, this is definitely a gringo rock, right? Um, this piece is pretty nice, right? It's got a nice shape, lots of avenues of attack, and... Um, it uh, is already relatively flat, okay? So the shape of the rock is helping me with this one. So I'm just going to find the convenient angles of attack and try to start working toward a trade platform. I'm not yet deciding I'm going to make a certain tool. I'm trying to, as efficiently as possible, get as many of the lumps and bumps and, and nasty stuff off. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a flake removed. That is too thin to make anything else out of. So that is a trash piece. You can see it's getting flatter as I go across. Okay. Now here I don't really have a good way to work on that. Because this lump is where I would hit and that's too close to the center of the mass for a flake to detach. So I'm going to skip over it, and I'm going to turn the rock up this way. Well, now the center of mass is way up here in the direction that I'm hitting. So I can come, take a bit off of that corner. And we have found just such a crack. Do you see how that flake, instead of coming off smooth, hiccuped? Yeah. Oh, I know why that did that. You see that little white spot? Mm -hmm. That's a fossil inclusion that was not solidified. Um, so cool. when the shock wave, imagine throwing two rubber duckies on a, on, in the bathtub. You get two nice clean ripples, but once they intersect, it's chaos. Yeah. It's not really chaos. It's a fraction pattern, but it's chaotic. Okay? So my flake went in hit some of that poor material and lost the predictability, okay? So that's what happened. Now this spot here is also a poorly solidified region, but I want to try and get the middle of this rock a little bit lower than that so it's less likely to crawl this way, but I still don't have a good way to hit it here. So I need to reshape that edge. I'm just going through all of my tools. I got copper. I'm at least within 10,000 years. So we're good. And I'm just going to take some small flakes off of the edge itself. See, that was just to remove that problem. Okay. Now, 
I had that concavity, and I could knock that off. The problem came along for the ride, but I'm okay with that. Okay, getting flatter. Now, what I don't like is there's a little seam in here. Because these cracks can grow in spider web. Mm -hmm. Right? If you get one problem, it can propagate itself with the impact. Right? So this is now my top priority. I've got to get under that faster than it spider webs on me. I want to get some of this weak material out of here. Again, I've got a little lump there. I'm just trying to get rid of that lump so I can get this taken off. Because I have to take that off in the next big blow so it doesn't start propagating and growing out through the rock. what I wanted. Now the lump's gone. Mm. And I have a nice place to strike it. There. That's what I wanted. Now that whole problem spot's out of there. And now the rest of this is fairly safe. Um, now I've got a bad contour. Oh, there's another pre-existing crack there. Can you see that? Right along there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Again, I don't want that to propagate. And there's a garbage pocket right above it. Right? So this end of the rock is not doing anything for me. And I'm just going to knock it off. <laughs> okay. Now, I still have nice ability to work on this edge, but if you can see here, those last two flakes, they kind of came in and, and spooned up a little bit. Now, if I come in below them, the shockwave will come into that point, and that will become easier to break off right there than to keep going through. Um, Nappers call that stacking when it goes in and then breaks off with a 90 degree angle. So I need to get rid of that line before I take any more flakes from that direction. Okay, so that means I come from the other side or from this end. And I'd like to get a little bit of the mass off of this end here. Okay. And what kind of flake is that? Are you a copper flake or are you an antler flake? I think you're an antler flake. Just looking at how sharp it is. If it doesn't detach with the antler, I can always go back to the copper. Okay. So there, a lot of that mass is out. Now this one's kind of coming into an even taper, except for that little bit. Now I'm going to come, flakes like to follow ridges because it confines the shock. Because the shock can't go out into the less viscous material of the air. Okay. okay. So they like to follow ridges. So I can come um, from the other side and knock that off. Now we're getting really thin here. Okay. And now that whole ridge I was worried about is gone, and I can resume mm. flaking from that edge, okay? But I do have to be careful about something, because you see how this is sort of very convex here? Mm -hmm. It's going to be very easy to take a lot of flakes from the here, and I'm going to take a couple more because I need to get this thin, but I've got to take some flakes off of this oh. side too, right? 
But you see how I'm coming in? I'm getting thinner and thinner here at the ends. Mm -hmm. I want to take this chunk off before I turn the edge and work toward there, or I'll lose just too much of my rock. So I'm going to take another couple flakes in that direction. Okay? We have a nice dead flat surface. Okay. And we have a more reasonable edge turning job. Okay. This is sloping in the wrong direction. So in order to get, if I, if I keep taking flakes off here, I end up with no stone left and still have a big old hump on this side. Right. So it's time to address that side. Um, so I'm going to drop down a size of hammer. And I'm just going to work on zigzagging this edge until I can get a place to strike where I can take that big mm. turtle back off. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is a lot, if you ever heard of Lavawa, this is a lot of the strategy that they specialized in. They would deliberately make these turtle backs as a core, prepare a nipple here to hit, and then take that off with just an instant knife. Hmm. I'm not good at it. I'm a bad Neanderthal. You see how I'm reversing the slope of this? Mm -hmm. It had been here, now it's here. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm working on doing. But I needed to get this thickness reduced right before I could do that. Neanderthal were not brutes, by the way. It was a uh, study I saw about a year ago it's looking at dental dental plaque mm -hmm. and showed that several tribes are vegetarian hmm. okay do okay. so you see how I've shaped that different now. So I want to strike right there where, yeah, right there where the corner is and remove this big hump. Okay. And I think this one I really like copper, especially solid copper because it's got a lot of mass and a really tight radius. Right, whereas um, you know, your big moose billets, they're really good when you have wide continuous edges and it's not super critical where you hit on that edge because there's a lot of area that you're striking with. Mm. You know, but when you need to hit a spot, I really like the copper or even, you know, here you could go back to hammerstone even, right? Okay, didn't get the whole thing off. But I also still have plenty of edge to work with. This is why I'm a bad Neanderthal. A Neanderthal would have gotten this whole chunk off in one in one lump. Right? Whereas I'm going to do it in several. Okay. And this little concavity there, I can't predict where it's gonna hit, so I need to reshape that. <coughs> get a little bit of this out of the way. That teeny tiny little spot right there, it's just in my way. <laughs> just in my way. So 
so I'll move it out of my way. I don't really want to lose edge there. I'm not really trying to reshape things. I'm just trying to make sure they don't hit it in the wrong spot. Now, with any luck, sounded good. It was a tiny flake. Now this one, where I said getting stuff out of the way, I hit too high. Mm. I took out more than I wanted in there. Still okay. Still okay. We'll still get a point. But I need to go back and reshape the edge a little bit more. Now when you get to this stage, slow down, okay? Slow way down. Now you've got to study it. Where can you get in? Make sure you set up the platforms right. So I don't have a platform that I'm really in love with right here. But this is a great one right there to take that off. It's fairly sharp. It's fairly sharp, it's fairly even, and it's fairly wide. So this is a good opportunity to go antler on that. Okay. And that worked very nicely. Mm -hmm. You can see how I'm hitting a wide face with this, not trying to really, you know, snipe at a little corner when you're using the antler. It's more of copper's job. Okay, that was nice. That was nice. That hinged, that stacked right there. You see that little vertical? It went in too deep relative to the thickness of flake that was going to come off, so it made a little stack. That's a little guy. That, that won't be a problem in the long run. But we are about at the point with this that that could be called a trade platter. Right? So if we're off on our journey to the flint quarry, this is about where you put it in your knapsack and get ready to take it on home. It's not committed to a tool yet. Right? This... This and this size is headed for a knife form. Okay? Right, imagine coming in and there it is. If I bring this in, I kind of draw on it here a little bit with this little copper point. Right? Coming in kind of here and there into the final point. Mm -hmm. Right? Kind of in there is where I would expect this point to be when it's all done. This is that that length, assuming I keep all of the length and don't do something dumb and snap a tip off, that's knife territory, right? If we get that much, mm -hmm. right? That's kitchen knife territory, right? That's not an arrowhead. <laughs> that's not even a spear point, too brittle. That's kitchen knife, okay? So, at the same time, it's not really committed. I could even up this edge here, put a notch in here, and have a height scraper. Right? Not mm -hmm. committed. So I could um, bring it in this way, deliberately snap off that tip, and have an adz blade for woodworking. Right? Not committed yet. So this is the stage at which it would enter trade and commerce. Right? Because you see how much material has been wasted off of this. If you don't have any pack animals, do you want to pack all of that extra material? No. Right? So this is what enters commerce. Now, the final stages. Um, 
and I'm just looking for a good piece to demonstrate this is a piece of, of glass little uh, olive oil bottle bottom mm -hmm. okay the final stages when because there's there's another hour in that till we get to the final stages minimum right um, and it's getting dark I don't think we even have an hour of daylight yet right now so um, the final stages are pressure flaking okay where we're going to take a tool with a fine point this is my obviously this is a very modern version of a copper tool right but it's it's nice got a little set screw so you can change the point it's convenient um, or just an antler tip okay and I, I use both of these again I like to use the copper when I need to hit a really fine point and the antler when I'm working a broad edge the the same ideas apply right and if we actually need to do a little bit of prep on this piece um, when we get into the final stage we want to do the detail work instead of doing everything with percussion like this we will start to do work just by pressing on the stone and removing flakes with pressure. So all the same rules apply, the same angles. These pieces of glass are a little annoying to get started, but glass is a good tool. If you're thinking, I want to try this, where do I get material? This is a great way to start. Okay, you can learn the basic dynamics and little little small things that people throw away. Okay, you know, same thing. That's a really nice little uh, tiny flake and you can really see the mm -hmm. ripple of the shockwave. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a nice rewarding little project if you want to tinker but aren't at the point where you want to buy material. Yeah. And I'm just trying to make a little platform just to demonstrate pressure flaking here. And then we'll kind of go to questions. So the angle is the same. It's going to be a little harder to see. I know the light's kind of failing on us here. Right? Just the angle is the same. I'm going to put the tip here and press in that direction. The tip is below the center of mass in the direction I'm pressing. Okay? All of the same rules apply, but I'm going to wad up some leather in my hand so I don't jam glass splinters into my palm. <clears throat> Put the heavier leather here. Now, I like to do this with my knees. There's a lot of different ways to pressure flake. If you can take a tool and accomplish flaking, you've replicated something from history somewhere in the world. I guarantee it. Right? It has all been done every possible material every possible technique okay. has been done remember three and a half million years of history here right nothing so new under the sun. <laughs> nothing new under the sun right and now i'm going to put this i lost my spot there we go there's my spot put this antler tip on there and i'm going to squeeze with my knees right i don't care how much upper body strength you have you have more lower body strength okay for any size of human, I don't care how much bicep strength you have, your legs are stronger. Okay? So I'm going to put one hand firmly against my left knee, the butt of this antler firmly against my right knee, and I'm going to squeeze this way until I build the maximum amount of pressure I can, and then with my right arm, pull the tool toward my belly. Okay? That's the motion. So I'm going to put it, I lost my spotting. There we go. Keep losing my little platform. Want to make sure that it's not going to crush, that there's not a, a weak edge that could crush on me. Put that against my knee, that against the platform. 
build the pressure, and then pop the flake. Okay? And there's what we did. So you can see that pressure flake was actually longer than those two percussion flakes. Now, this smooth lenticular form here, really easy to get a flake to travel around because it's just congruent with that 110 degree angle. So in setting this up this way, yeah, I'm cheating. People who really know flit now, like, this is like the, a very simple flake to make, but it shows the idea. And this is how you do your final shaping, your final notching, your final sharpening and how you resharpen, okay? And how you resharpen. So if you were depending on stone tools that are chip stone tools and not ground stone tools, which is an entirely different conversation, right? If you, if you have ground, ground jade knives, you're, you're not doing this in even remotely the same way. But um, if you are depending on chip stone tools, you always have an antler tip on you because that's how you sharpen your knife, right? Man, woman, or child, you always have an antler tip handy because that's how you sharpen your knife. Mm. And to sharpen, you would just, you know, flick. Everywhere there's a dull spot, you would put a tool there and just flick it off. You're not trying to make big, glorious flakes because you don't want to lose any more width than, than you need to. You're just flicking off the dull spots. That's your final sharpening. Here, I'm still shaping. Okay, and I can do the same thing with the copper, and the geometry of the tool is going to change the body dynamics slightly, right? But you know, here it's like both the backs of my hands, put the copper tool on a likely looking platform, squeeze, and pop. That was not quite as glorious, but it wasn't quite as well set up either. Okay, and if you just want, you know, like little ones. Just for resharpening, it would just, you know, be in hand. Little flakes like that. And that's how you would resharpen it. Okay? If you want to notch it, you would take a couple in one direction, a couple in the other direction, you know, and you can build a notch right into the piece. Okay? And again, all sorts of material are authentic for different cultures, but my culture is me, right? Like I, uh, there's an unbroken train of knowledge. My culture, my techniques, these are authentically my toolkit, right? Every possible tool that works has been used by somebody. I mean, not titanium or aluminum, obviously, but, you know, from copper... You know, copper, bone, ivory, rib bones from various animals, leg bones from various animals cut into splinters for notchers, like lashed to a piece of wood. Those are all authentic tools and used by various cultures in various places. You go north, you get a lot of ivory being used for things. You know, the, the, the mastodon ivory up in the northern rain, you know, northern tier of the, of the continent shows up a lot. Walrus ivory shows up a lot in these sorts of toolkits. Um, whale tooth ivory, not so much. Uh, warthog teeth, legit, people use it. You know, anything like that. Wooden billets, ebony, rosewood, um, persimmon, which is really just a type of ebony. Um, live oak, these really hard woods, all legitimate. Right, so wherever you are, whatever you have access to, you can figure out a toolkit that authentically represents your position. I'm a nerd, and this authentically represents my nerdiness. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, my toolkit. So, you know, it's, it's just what you find, you're continuing a long living tradition, what you can find is legitimate. And if you start getting out into, you know, online message boards, people are already there to always there to lecture you on what's authentic or not authentic. It's like, wow, 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 go home. 
Uh, <laughs> this is a living tradition. <laughs> Let it evolve, please. <laughs> you know? So, questions about this or anything related to it? Hold off on questions. I gotta change battery. Oh, they could ask questions.